We were American citizens of Japanese ancestry, uh, uh, ordered by the President of the United States to be imprisoned in the United States, in our case, uh, Arkansas, and guarded over by the U.S. military. They were American concentration camps for Americans of Japanese ancestry. So they called them relocation centers. They were, they were America's versions of concentration camps. Anyway... Uh... All that she could remember is just blood everywhere in the mess hall. That's all she could remember. He and his family were put in a horse stall. They were given Your father yeah, was were, put in a horse stall? Yeah, they were given burlap bags, told to, just to stuff it with uh, the hay, whatever was in now, there. Many have compared what happened to all these different groups it's happening now with the Muslims. Now, Muslims are perceived as the other, right. but a Muslim can be Irish, Japanese, like we can see right That's here. Right. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum, greetings of peace. Welcome to the Dean Shaw Media, your host. And we got a lot to talk about today with my next guest, Brian Ozaki. How are you? Alhamdulillah, I'm doing well. Thank you. Very nice to have you here with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, we're going to be talking about the, uh, the uh, camps that were set up here in the United States, uh, Hiroshima and Nakazaki. All this is set up now. I mean, all this is part of some of the work you do to create awareness of a history that's actually been forgotten. Yes, about the uh, Japanese American internment camps uh, that happened back in 1940 during, uh, or the 1940s during World War II. Mm -hmm. Correct. Now, your parents were in those camps? Yes, both my parents. Uh, my dad's side was, uh, they're from Seattle. So they went to a different camp. They were ended up in uh, Minidoka in Idaho. Mm -hmm. And my mom is from California. She bounced around for three camps and uh, she was separated. Her and her mom were separated from uh, their father. Um, he is, uh, in a Japanese term, they call him Kibe. So they're born in the United States. They are uh, educated in Japan and then brought back to the United States. Um, and because he was able to read and write, um, he was separated as soon as uh, Pearl Harbor uh, was bombed by Japan. And he was sent to a Department of Justice camp in Santa Fe and my mom and her mother were sent to three different camps uh, uh, all the while being separated. So they call it internment camps. But it's not really an internment. What does uh, that mean? What are they trying to say about internment camps? You know, it wasn't really um, for their protection, yeah. the Japanese Americans. Two thirds of the Japanese Americans, 120,000, they're American citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, they were incarcerated. Uh, the numbers are, I heard were probably even more. This is a low, lower number. Lower it's possible number. because uh, there were numbers from um, Alaska. Uh, people from Peru were brought over. Um, people were put in Department of Justice camps and not only the War Relocation Authority camps. Um, so the numbers could have been larger. And only the people that were on the western seaboard were, were truly affected by it. Mm -hmm. But though, so those were, okay, so paint the picture to us. What got us uh, thinking that this is far away from reality is something that not too long ago, people were actually talking about putting Muslims in these camps. That's right. Right? Absolutely. And uh, the Japanese Americans um, had people who were in the camps that were incarcerated uh, generations past. They stood up right away. As soon as they heard about this Muslim ban, one died out they w jumped out and they were on the front lines talking about we've been here before we know where this is going so they were out there they were picketing they were showing their solidarity with the uh with the with the muslim people who the ja the japanese yes the yeah. japanese americans they're like we've heard this story before absolutely yeah yeah now paint the picture i mean okay these these are now many people don't understand that these were american citizens Yes, they were right. uh, two thirds were American citizens. Uh, they were born here, um, and that just didn't really matter. the The writing on the wall was that it was for the Japanese American their protection. Uh, however, any of the camps that if anybody visited or had pictures of, there were guard towers and there was barbed wire and there were gun turrets on the top, but they were facing inside towards the camp, not outside away from the camp so they weren't 
protecting anybody from coming into the camp. They were protect. They were trying to make sure nobody from inside the camp was going to get out. Now, was there was there a justifiable means to this? Was there something going on that there was some evidence proof that now citizens were going to rebel against their government? There wasn't actual proof. Uh, what happened was there was a lot of wartime hysteria. There was a lot of fear. There was already an, an anti-Asian sentiment happening way before 1941. And this was just an excuse. Um, there was um, the Chinese Exclusion Act uh, that was going on, and they needed uh, cheap labor to come in to help farm on the West Coast. So they brought uh, Japanese in to farm. They were able to farm land that was thought to be just you couldn't grow anything on it. And they were able to do it. So then what happened was this was kind of uh, this kind of helped uh, the Farmers Association to, yeah, let's let's get behind this. We'll push the Japanese Americans out. We can take their property and their fields and their growth. That's what actually happens when they got put in these camps, all their businesses, properties, everything, uh, the, the locals, whoever people ended up taking that. Yes. They, you were only allowed to bring what you could carry. And yeah. that was it. People were selling their property, their farming equipment, their businesses for it, nothing. Yeah, a lot of it just got, I mean, did it, they didn't end up getting that back, right? No. So it was it was stolen? Yes. Pretty much. Yeah. Just to put it bluntly. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and now, so this lasted three years. Did, but before that, it was for, for some time, that there was a sentiment that there was this fear-mongering going on, kind of like what we see today. Exactly. That's ex it's, the, it's exactly what's happening. And you can see the similarities. And there are some people out there that's, that will say, this is completely different than what happened to the Japanese Americans. What happened with the Japanese Americans, they were U.S. citizens, people that these bands, like the Muslim ban or the people seeking refuge and asylum, they're saying they're not U.S. citizens. The problem is, is that we're treating people inhumanely. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the real focus of it. And what you did to a group of people that didn't look like the rest of the world or the rest of the country, that's what's happening now. And people really don't know Muslims. People really don't know the people who are trying to seek asylum, no matter where they're from. So there's a fear out there. But they're treating them so inhumanely. Mm -hmm. Well, you have uh, Muhammad Ali. He's a... Uh... A, a he's a citizen the guy who built the the muslims who built the sirius towers they're uh citizens right yeah. so the, the same thing here you have you have so many uh, american uh, muslim americans who were born here who now people uh, start to look at like suspiciously you know with the the, the media giving half truths and the politicians right a lot of times pushing a lot of this division hate absolutely just like um I'm not, I don't know if you're aware, Asia Bendawi, she's from Bridgeview. She made a documentary. Uh, Bridgeview was under surveillance for many years before 9-11. The government couldn't find anything, so they stopped surveillance. Then 9-11 happened, and then, you know, then they started to surveil again. But nothing came out of it. They couldn't find anybody that was doing anything wrong. Mm -hmm. So now, going back to the internment camps, or the camps uh, pretty much just like jails that were set up uh, that were that were housing over a hundred uh, that incarcerated over 120,000 plus of American citizens, pretty much uh, the Japanese. And then after three years, then they were released. They were released. Uh, you could have gotten out earlier if you had a sponsor, somebody um, on the interior of the United States that could sponsor you for a job. Um, the places that the, the, the 10 camps that were created, they were not there. So they were built as they were being relocated. So first, people were put in places like state fairs, open fields, horse farms, like my dad went to pile up in uh, on the West Coast. And what happened was he and his family were put in a horse stall. They were given Your father yeah, was were, put in a horse stall? Yeah, they were given burlap bags told to just to stuff it with uh, the hay, whatever was in there, and they stayed there for a while until Minidoka was ready. What was your father doing before this happened? What was he involved in? What kind of a business? What was he? What he was, was in what school, did... but what happened, but his family, they, they took care of um, 
like a rooming house uh, in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did they feel that they felt this was coming on? Was this was this something no. that just overnight people came and yeah. saw, came and took them and for my for my dad's side of the family that's how it felt to them. Yeah. Yeah. So now then then what happens is from there um and this is without any trial without any um right a, a notice went up executive order 9066 went up told them to be at a specific designated area and to be there with what you can carry in your hands and that was it from there they were taken by buses with uh, shades drawn so you couldn't see out and people couldn't see in they got dropped off at for my parents like for my dad they got dropped off at the at the uh, racetrack um, and then from there when they went to Minidoka they got onto trains and took um, the train to Minidoka it is a desolate area in Idaho it's uh, by Twin Falls, Idaho, there is nothing but dust in the in the summer. It's hot in the winter. It's snow. Um, they were makeshift uh, barracks with just tar paper on the outside, so uh, dust came in, snow came in. It was cold, and you had multiple families living in one barracks. So you just got a notice saying, "Show up here." All what did it read? Like all Japanese citizens? Yeah. So that that's what it read, and then you you show literally it said all Japanese yeah need to report here and here or you're all, gonna be uh, what shot killed what I mean it's or there's no, some kind of consequence because what happened was they made it seem as though it was for their protection yeah um, but everybody was stripped of their identity so you were not given your name you were not you didn't get to keep your name you were given a tag a tag with a number you're little a t you're you become a number yes so yeah? you had a tag with a number you put that on each person in your family. Do you remember what number your father was? Or I don't. So they got a number. Yeah. That's how they are identified. Yeah. Not by their name anymore, by no. that number. Wow. No. And that's not too, that's, that was just that's, around the corner. It was really, It's. it was 78 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And then pretty much your life, your whole livelihood, everything that you worked up until about that time, it was all gone then, right? Pretty much. Yeah. And then when camps let out, um, like my mom and her mom, they they had nowhere to go, so they stayed in camps until it closed uh, in '46. And then, um, when you got let out, you were given twenty five dollars and a train ticket, mm -hmm. and that was it. That was it. Yeah. Reagan, sometime later, he paid out some. Uh, yeah, he did. There was uh, there was some money that was paid out, like twenty thousand dollars, to yeah. each person that was still living, uh, that was incarcerated. Uh huh. Correct. What What did you think about that? You know, I was a kid, so, you know. Your parents, how did they? Right. Did they... I mean, to my dad, it was a slap in the face. Mm -hmm. um, my dad took this to heart. And my dad was a certain way his entire life. Um, he was, I mean, he couldn't be more pro-American than anybody. Mm -hmm. um, he ended up fighting for the United States during the Korean War. Um he only bought American cars. Uh, if anybody uh, disrespected the flag, he was going to tell you right away. I mean, he just, he loved America. And there was things that he did that it wasn't until later on that I figured out why he did it. You know, like he didn't want to be known as Japanese or Asian or somebody different. He wanted to be that American guy. But... You know, you, you can't erase the color of your skin. You mm -hmm. can't erase the way that your features look, you know. But, you know, it's that's what happened to him. That's how he lived out his life based off of what happened to him. Mm -hmm. So then, then you have the releasing of the, um, the Japanese from the, the camps uh, around 19... About 45, 46. That's when Hiroshima and Nagasaki happened, right? Well, Hiroshima, yeah. So it was right after that where Japan kind of like, they lost the war and then they just, that was it. And they were releasing people before that if they had sponsors, but it was after that that they just kind of said, okay, we're releasing. Yeah. How yeah. many people died in that? 
innocent people. I mean, innocent lives. A ton of innocent people died. I don't have that number, but a ton of people died. To this day, you have people who are still uh, yeah suffering. Absolutely. I I went and saw, and this was many years ago, probably over ten years ago. I went to go see a woman who wrote this book called Atomic Mom, and she she was one of the the women who helped develop the atomic bomb, and then she worked with some Japanese uh, women and they were probably second or third generation and she was still having uh, issues, health issues from the atomic bomb. Yeah, it's in the uh, hundreds of thousands minimum. That's These are probably low numbers. I mean, and then millions who have been affected still where there's this indiscriminate just bomb on... on just on so, humanity. And on, so, yeah. you know, we're the only country to ever use this bomb. And now, you know, we're the ones that are telling people not to use it, right? But we have the most of them. Uh -huh. yeah. So we talk about these things now to, um, and why do you now, why do you, you, you're part of an organization that comes out and speaks and creates awareness. What motivated you to do that, to be a part of something like this? Uh, you know, it had to have been my family and my dad, you know, the second and third generations, they didn't really speak about this stuff at all. They didn't speak about the camps. I had to really do my research and then pull it out of my parents. They didn't want to talk about it. They were still traumatized probably, right? Yeah, yeah it was definitely. just a part of history that, you know, they didn't want to talk about it. They, they lived it, they experienced it, but they didn't want to talk about it. So mm -hmm. I kept pulling it out of them. Um, and you know, it, it was something that I remembered that I didn't learn about too much. I just heard about a little bit and that was it. Um, so, you know, when my son was in the fifth grade, they were his teacher. She's brilliant. And she was going over this chapter in history and she happened to find out from my son that his grandparents, my parents were in these camps. So she, really sent my wife and I a letter asking, please, can they come in? So my parents said no, but I eventually got them to say yes. And they came into the school and they taught, and they shared their experience with the class in a very G rated version for the fifth graders. And they, they, they recorded it. And, uh, ever since then, I mean, this was seven years ago, eight years ago. And every year since then, she see, she shows this video to the kids and the kids send my parents thank you cards and just how they can relate what they remembered from the stories and i mean that's incredible that that's a way to get this awareness out and with jacl which is an organization that i sit on the board with they have a program where they go out to schools and to organizations and they teach this history and that is a new program that started a couple of years ago and it's something that it needs to be taught so people just don't forget what had happened to innocent people you know back in the 40s mm -hmm. are there any uh, stories unique stories that stand out i'm sure you heard you've heard a lot from people who are such as your family or others who have been into these camps at that time that you recall that had a profound impact that you can share with us yeah you know it's the Japanese community, the Japanese American community, you know, I, at one point in my life, I thought, where are they? And then I found out they're around. You just, they just dispersed a lot more. Um, my dad used to tell me about a guy, a kid that he knew when he was in camp that drowned in this river uh, while they were at camp. Well, a few years ago in 2017, I was talking to this lady and I was interviewing her for a project. That boy, she knew that boy. That boy actually saved her sister's life. Uh, her sister had a blood disease and she needed a transfusion and this boy had the exact blood match. He saved her life and then he went on passing away in the river. I mean, the odds of the, the relationship of my dad to this boy and to this boy to this woman and her sister i mean they're from opposite ends of this country i mean it's amazing um you know 
there are a lot of stories out there of um, people witnessing. Uh, one person witnessed a uh, a chef. Oh, this is the same lady. She witnessed the chef that got shot by the, the military police. Um, and all that she could remember is just blood everywhere in the mess hall. That's all she could remember. Um, and why, he passed why, away. why did he shoot him? Nobody knows. She doesn't know. She just knows that he he uh, got shot. Mm-hmm. Um, she didn't remember. So how how much uh, if you, you if you look back uh, of the people because you have really good hearted uh, Americans here who wouldn't stand for that, you know how many were fighting against that as opposed to the other you know the the people of prejudice people who uh, exercise racism uh, people who had that hate in their hearts who were pushing this there must have been some kind of divide there what, what was there how was it like you know when you looked into this yeah it, back in the 40s because there was an anti-asian sentiment happening yeah um and i think also there, i think there were several different things that were happening at that time one that being it also the japanese uh tend to be they, they kind of keep to themselves and they don't create waves yeah right so also at that time of all the documents of all the pictures of any of the home videos Nobody stood up for the Japanese Americans. There was no one protesting. No one protesting. There were some that like were friends because they knew that, like from the community. So some people saved some of the property. Some people saved some belongings. But it wasn't like today where you see, you know, groups of thousands of people out there protesting against, you know, anti-immigration or the Muslim ban or women's rights. You don't, you don't, you didn't see that back then. No. How about the uh, the the exercising of uh, one of the um, statements uh, attributed to Jesus, "Love your neighbor." All the verses that talk about peace and love. Did you have these Christians coming up? And you, there had to have been some coming up. You didn't hear much about that. I haven't, I haven't read or seen anything like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's possible it it could exist, but yeah. of all the documentations that I've I've read and uh, and the videos and the pictures that I've seen, see, I just didn't see. See, these that. are times when God is testing humanity. You see, it's it's human beings. A lot of times we want to blame the Creator, God Almighty. We say Allah, and then these wars happen. But it's the human beings that start these wars. The human beings that cause this corruption on earth. And then God Almighty, Allah, He gives us these opportunities for right. people to step up and show their their mercy, to come up and show that love. And then now this is going to be a witness against a lot of people on the day That's of judgment. Right. See, because it's easy to profess faith, I believe in God and all that, but what are you doing when you see injustice like this happening? Yeah, and, and I think everybody has their level of how they perceive that or take that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us free will, right? And it's up to us to do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to do, right? Um, so, I, I I just think that I guess it depends on what's more important at that time, maybe. Yeah. I, I couldn't tell you. I can only tell you what how I feel about that. Yeah. So some of our viewers just probably got surprised they heard you say the, the, the <laughs> term Allah, which simply means uh, 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 the Creator, God Almighty, uh, and they're wondering. So you, you actually you had some exposure to Islam, and then uh, you, you actually yourself ex- accepted Islam and became a Muslim? I did. Uh, and for those that, that don't know, Islam simply means to submit your will to the Creator, and a Muslim was one who does that action of submitting to the will of the one God. That's right. So you were saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I did. Um, I grew up very different, and, uh, you know, I, I grew up in a Buddhist home, mm-hmm. and didn't work for me. And I think... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every single day, multiple times a day for for being here, for telling me, teaching me, guiding me what I need to do to prepare myself for Jannah, right? Mm-hmm. So it's 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 hard to describe. For me it's it's like a it's a feeling that brings a smile to my face. Mm-hmm. You know? Uh 
Alice Pond Pilot gives me purpose. Yeah. You know, I, so, I mean, this, whatever I can do to help humanity to my ability, I mean, I'm not anybody, but whatever I can do, say something to somebody, spread awareness, you know, it's, and, and that's one of the means to fulfilling the purpose of life is to be when you're in the service, when you're worshiping, serving your creator, you're serving mankind. You're trying to be a good asset, a good ambassador. Uh, you're trying to be a good humanitarian. You're trying to spread goodness. And this is one of those things. This is one of those ways. Um, but w w you've obviously had to really engross yourself in studying the text, the Quran, the Sunnah, uh, because you would not have come I'm assuming for sure someone who parents were oppressed uh, they've seen oppression and now you have the media making Islam look like it's a terrorist religion making it look like it's an oppressive uh, way of life for women you wouldn't I mean going why would you go in that direction if you didn't learn the opposite you know it's, I, I think it's because I've been around Muslims for more than half my life and you know i i have i've always stood up for islam because you know a lot of people don't have that knowledge and when somebody doesn't have even the most basic knowledge they become fearful and when they become fearful they become i don't know angry or belligerent yeah and you know i would to to the best of my knowledge at that point in time i would try to you know tell them that whatever you're hearing it's just it's not what it is right and you try to give them examples and people would pull things from here and there and say well this says this i and you know you got to tell them well you, you're giving them just this small portion you can't base your judgments on just this one portion. You know, you have to have the entire text before and after it to get an entire picture. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it's not even that simple. You have to have the whole parts even before that and after that to truly understand that. And then you have to have the the stories that that backfill that, right? Like the hadiths, right? You need some of that information to give it more context. Yeah. So it's not as cut and dry and saying, oh, they're barbarians and they treat their women terribly and they're not allowed to do this and they can have, you know, X amount of wives. It's just, you know, you can't get angry with people like that. You just have to try to tell them that, you know, that's not what it is and this is what it is, mm -hmm. right? Now we saw, we saw that, um, that hate being perpetuated with many people who have come over to the Americas, starting with, let's say you had the Catholics, so you had Christian on Christian hate, so you had the Christians hating on the Catholics from here, and then you had the Irish, then you had, what came after that? Then now you start coming along, you had the um, the Japanese now. Now we have a live example of your parents who are in those jails, those camps, so we saw, we can see like when anyone who was perceived as the other, right? Right? Who doesn't who doesn't walk like us, talk like us, have the the uh, the slang like us, doesn't have skin like color like us? Right. They're the other, but it it even went so far back as to other just they had the skin same color but maybe a different little dialect. Sure. But now it's coming. So we have a live example we were giving with your story, your family story, of something that didn't just happen yesterday. It was just it was some it was um yeah it was like seventy eight years ago yeah it was just around the corner yeah and now history is there so we can study it so hopefully we can get some good from it and not let the evils repeat itself but now many have compared what happened to all these different groups it's happening now with the muslims now muslims are perceived as the other right. but a muslim can be irish japanese like we can see right That's here right. mexican uh, italian uh, white american because a muslim is one like jesus moses abraham muhammad peace be upon them all one who just submits to the will of god that's right yeah, absolutely. And I think that's what the power, you know, a lot, a lot of the um, the satanic forces and, and, and the people of division, the people who want to spread this hate, that's where they fear Islam a lot because it, Islam brings humanity together. You know, 
uh, Islam is something that unites people under the worship of one God, doing good deeds, being a good human being. And I had a, an interview with a Christian not too long ago, Mr. Benjamin, and his followers, they were watching the program, and they got to see us interact and talk. And then they, we heard some of their feedback, and one, I, I just, I was amazed to see like what some people were saying. One particularly stuck, stuck out. He said, "I cannot be, believe how stupid I was." Something like that, saying that I don't believe anything the media says, majority of it. But why, why now? He had to come to terms with his own self and say, "Why now, when it comes to Muslims, do I believe what the media says?" But another thing, I question everything. But now, when it comes to Muslims, when they say something against Muslims in Islam, I just swallow it whole. Right. You know? Oftentimes, you know, if you don't know any Muslims, right, you don't know, right? You, you have no idea. And then you have to think, you know, what does a Muslim look like? You know, I, I hear oftentimes about how people are like, well, you know, you don't look like a Muslim or, you know, uh, how do I know uh, if you're Muslim or not, right? You know, it's... It, it's not something you wear unless, you know, if you wear a hijab or, you know. Yeah. But, um, you know, what does a Muslim look like? You know, it looks like you. Looks you? like me. I mean, yeah. you know. Uh, We're totally now opposite probably to what people will be thinking the Muslims look like. Right. Because right? they're thinking some Arab in the desert, big turban with a sword on a camel. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. You know, it's like whatever they want to show in the movies, right? In the yeah. entertainment. Uh huh. But they got two right now. Sitting in front of them on the on the screen, big screen, huh? <laughs> yeah. So we crushed that stereotype right there. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Another another thing is when you think about the justice and the beauty of of this beautiful way of life, Islam, that would never allow something like when you look at this 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 um, this indiscriminate bombing of uh, hu innocent human beings, like the Hiroshima Nagasaki. I mean, Muslims didn't do this. I mean, this is something that Islam is totally, you have no, there is no exception to killing innocent human beings. Just killing indiscriminately. Killing one person is like killing all of mankind. That's right? a verse from the Quran. Yeah. You, you got to take that to heart. I mean, you have to believe it. Yeah. So it's crazy how, you know, uh, some of these, some, some, you, you see some people doing the worst heinous criminal acts and then flipping it and trying to make Muslims, you know, as they're the the people terrorizing and spreading corruption in the earth. It's amazing. It reminds me of one a verse in the Quran where God Almighty is talking about this. Mm -hmm. Talking about they wish to spread I'm paraphrasing, saying that they're the, the people of peace, but they're actually the ones spreading corruption uh, in the land. It's crazy. It is. Yeah. It's unfortunate. And I think... Um, you know, part of what people on the outside would see is they're seeing culture as opposed to seeing the religion. Yeah. And um, I think sometimes it's not entirely their fault for seeing that too. Yeah. Right. So I think in, in some cases, you know, we have to take responsibility for that. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, you know, I, I, I believe in, in the pure faith. And uh, so, you know, I try to my best every day to, to do the best that I can based on Islam. What, what was it that finally had you? How much time did it take for you researching um, that you finally decided to, that this is the way of life from the creator and I'm going to accept it? You know, it's, I think it's, uh, I was tired of just uh, the way that I was living my life you know, nobody was holding me accountable for it, right? And I kept screwing up, you know, and when you screw up, oftentimes, you know, it hurts you, but a lot of times it hurts others too when you screw up. So, you know, I was tired of screwing up and I wasn't, the way I was living my life wasn't working and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed me, you know, I mean, he holds me accountable for all of my actions. And, you know, it's been a blessing. Mm -hmm. Have you, have you've traveled to Japan? When I was a kid before Islam, but I'm traveling to Japan, uh, inshallah, I'm traveling to Japan um, in a few months. How, how is uh, Islam being uh, received over there? I heard there's uh there's a growing, growing. Muslim, growing Muslim community in Japan. It's growing. And, you know, it's funny you bring that up 
last night I happened to turn on this Japanese uh, uh, show. It's a it's called NHK. So yeah. it's a it's it's a uh, it's a station, Japanese station in Japan, and they were talking about Islam. It was the craziest thing. My wife and I were we couldn't believe it, and and how it they like were a mainstream about, channel. It's a main. It's a Japanese station that shows nothing but things happening in Japan. It's like a, it's like watching CNN, but yeah. just it's all from Japan. And they were talking about this Pakistani guy that's been living there for 20 years and he immersed himself in the culture and he's Muslim and they, I think they're in an area where it's got the largest mosque. So they have, um, I think he said there's like 600 Muslims that pray here. Um, but in their newsfeed, it, they were mostly like uh, Pakistani. Um, I didn't see any Japanese. However, I have seen um, a couple of mosques in Tokyo. Um, and I I did read a story about uh, some Japanese people um, in Islam. And I read articles about how um, they're being more accommodating towards people in Islam. They dedicate prayer rooms in public spaces. Um, they're making halal and zabiha food more accessible for people. Um, there's a, a big Malaysian uh, a group that goes. I mean, it, it's you know they come, they do business, they uh, they vacation. So, you know, Malaysia is a huge Muslim population. Mm -hmm. So they are more accommodating towards. Um, Muslim people now. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful to hear. Yeah, you speak I, I, any? I'm no, I don't. Mm -hmm. um, I kick myself for that, and I'm sure my mom does too, because uh -huh. uh, my mom can speak. But um, I'm really excited to go because I really want to see like this Muslim culture out there. Yeah. Now the Japanese, some of the J Japanese uh, cultural things that that um, we know about. Tell me, tell me, is this true? Is like before you go into a Japanese house, you can't take your shoes. Uh, you have to take your shoes off. Yes. Right. That's part of Japanese culture. Yeah, they're very big into cleanliness. Okay. Um, so before you enter the house, you take your shoes off, um, and they. And so you would wear slippers, and then they would have special slippers for like the restroom. Yeah. So you only have the rest restroom slippers, and then you have the rest of the house slippers. Uh huh. I, and that's beautiful because Islam, you know, cleanliness, you know, purity is a part of of our iman, our faith. Yeah. So we do the same thing: take your shoes off in the house. Right, right. You're always making sure you're clean, right? Absolutely. Spiritually, physically. Absolutely. So now, when somebody from the Japanese they accept, this is one of those things of the culture that just goes really because with Islam you don't just throw everything out the culture. There's some things like, for instance, in some cultures, mainly here, uh, there's some a lot of good things, but there's some things like it's just common to go in the house with the shoes. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. You know. So you're bringing in like I did a program on this talking about this. <laughs> You know, uh, but this is something that people can adapt, take from from uh, one of the beautiful things, Islam and the Jap Japanese culture, right? Because they did a study about the hundreds of different uh, germs and, and things that you yeah. bring in and your shoes and you bring inside the house and put on your mm -hmm. bed. Yeah, you jump yeah. on the bed with your shoes on. Yeah, And that's the thing about now you think now you have because your way is superior, but then you end up putting other people down because you don't understand that why I got to take my shoes off this and that and the other. And then you're right. saying like, wow, this actually makes more sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what else is there with Japanese? They'll do the um, Japanese will uh, the tradition was more less handshake, more more of a nod. It, yeah, it's, it was a bow. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, and it's always kind of like, um, you know, there's different angles of bows. Yeah, tell us I, about that. Well, there's different angles of bows, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so depending on, you know, it's it's a, also a level of respect, yeah. right? Uh, whether it's a teacher or a parent or an elder, right? You would always try to at least have your bow lower than theirs, yeah. right? And you wouldn't... Uh, raise from your bow until they would raise first right mm -hmm. um it's a lot of it just is based off of respect yeah um you know uh you do martial arts yeah. brazilian jiu-jitsu um i do kendo so i there's there's a, there's a lot of similarities between uh the culture 
and Islam that yeah. I that I sometimes parallel. Yeah. Um, because it's important and it's and it's amazing on these parallels. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I, I think respect is a huge part of that. See now, now you can you you can res I mean that's the part about getting educated, uh, traveling, understanding other people's cultures, because again, this is another area where people start to put down Islam, put down Muslims. I make this parallel with the Japanese culture, and now let's say for instance someone it's a it's about great respect. Let's say someone uh, who's a Muslim, he shows great um, respect towards the opposite gender, a woman, right? He'll hug his mom, his aunt, and he'll hug her and squeeze his daughter. But now someone else's wife, he's not groping all, he's not kissing her, and no. almost on a, like on the cheek, but almost on the lips and stuff, and, yeah. you know, hugging her. And stuff. No, it's like respect. He respects your wife. He's not going to even touch her. He doesn't come in her space. That's right. Right? It's not about putting the woman down. That's right. Right? So I make this parallel. Well, now you can, because just because you don't understand, it's a little different than your culture. Why, why are you going to go crazy and start, you know, uh, spewing all sorts of uh, hate rhetoric and whatnot because you just don't understand? Yeah, I, I believe that's, you know, it, it's not for everybody and everybody doesn't do that. And I believe that it is. Yeah, hate, I'm specifically, you know, you know, yeah, the, the, the fear the, is, is it, it's, it's you're not born with it. No, no, it's, it's something you're taught, whether it's in the home or within your yeah. peers. Um, and it's just the lack of that education of knowing what you fear and what you hate you know what i'm talking about right I you do. have those specific group of people but it's sad because sometimes if uh, the good people they remain silent they don't speak out then it spreads like a disease <laughs> it does and then yeah. but you know hopefully you know within time you can maybe turn that disease around and yeah yeah that, hope that, for a cure yeah it's uh it's very important that's why um talking about these things and discussing it and helping people to understand because sometimes you are just brought up in your little town your little village, your little area, and all you get to see is people with the same color as you look like you, and then anything else, you don't travel much. And now any opportunity that something doesn't uh, look the same way you do it, then it's the other, and then you are develop that fear, and then you attack what you fear. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so just going back to what we started with, th that's why one of the things, is that one of the reasons now creating this awareness of these internment, these camps that were that were created for th that were there for three almost four years with the Japanese Americans uh, a good portion of them citizens that now if we don't um, remember this history that it can repeat itself again absolutely absolutely I mean um, if you just strip it back and you just talk about the humanity of it right I mean it's happening now with asylum seekers seeking a better life not only for themselves, for their families, right? And you have to kind of, you know, in Islam, you you should have this empathy. And um, you have to, you have to really think about why are, why are people wanting to come here? Why are people wanting to flee wherever their, their home is, right? Whatever their home is, wherever their home is, it must be wanting a better life. Right. And then to be treated at the gate and just treated just so inhumanely, you know, not giving them the opportunity to come into this country. Um, the percentage of asylum seekers that actually come in is like 0.04%, I believe it is. 0.04%. Mm -hmm. The camp that we were just at had about about 1800 people in it in Matamoros 1800 people so 0.04% of that population will come into the United States that's almost nothing and to see how they're forced to live just to, so they can have a better life no matter what they're fleeing whether it's violence uh, drugs uh, war Anything that they're fleeing to live and how they're living, to them it's so worth it to live in these conditions to flee from where they're fleeing. You have to think about if they're here living like this, imagine what they're, they're running from. And we have to, as humans, think harder about this and try to help them.
Where were you? so you went down? This was in Texas. It's right on the border of Brownsville, uh, Brownsville, Texas, uh -huh. just on the up, uh, opposite end of the Rio Grande is Matamoros, uh, Mexico, and that's where there's a there's a tent camp right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there they are. Those are the asylum seekers who are trying to come in. Yes. So what what's paint what what um you've been there? How is it down? What is what's the status of the people now? And what what happens when they enter these? Camp? They're in another. They're in a camp there, right? They're in a camp. They're in a tent camp, and they're on the levee side of the Rio Grande. Uh -huh. So if the Rio Grande ever floods, I mean they're gonna hit it. I mean they're in direct path of it. Yeah. Um. You know, they're they're segregated by kind of like by the country where they're from and um so they have these neighborhoods and they make do with what they have with with what god created you know they're making they're making kitchens out of what god created by by tree branches twine mud earth and then whatever they can find to use as a cooking element mm -hmm. like a like a part of a file cabinet they'll use as a stove top i mean the ingenuity that they have to survive is amazing um but you know when we were they don't have um uh, they don't have jobs they want jobs they want a life they want to provide for their family but we just aren't giving them this opportunity um it's they're given uh opportunities to go to court but the court is against them they don't have they don't have they're, they're such a language barrier that they don't have the information that they need in order to help them pass through into the united states mm -hmm. um you know they are sent back to either their country or another country and majority of them are facing death when they get there uh and you know when you feed them, there's an organization called World Central Kitchen. And they're a new uh, organization by Chef Andres, Andreas. And he creates this, this group, this World Central Kitchen, and they go to these post-emergency devastated areas like camps, like uh, in Japan, the cruise ship that's holding all, uh, all the people aboard the ship. Uh, because of the coronavirus uh, in the Bahamas, and they provide food. They provide food for people that need it, and it's such an amazing company. Uh, we went down there, we prepared food for like over 1,200 people, and it was so amazing. Uh, all the volunteers were so lovely and smiling, and they worked 18-hour days, seven days a week, preparing food, handing it out to people. These, these people are their friends. You know, these people are, are also volunteers and it's, you know, that's like the Umma mm -hmm. when you, when you watch this and yeah. you, you're down there and you look at this and it, it makes you just think like there's gotta be more that you can do. Mm -hmm. That's what Islam is about, huh? Helping humanity. It doesn't matter what color of your skin, what race, nationality. Where you come from, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. It doesn't matter what your economic status is. It doesn't matter whether you're born on this side or this side of the tracks. I mean, we're the same. We're, you know, their blood's the same color as mine. You know, mm -hmm. they breathe the same air as I do. You know, that's what it's about. How do your parents feel about you? Um, uh, uh, going and creating awareness now about the history of what the, some some I almost forgotten history going down to Texas visiting the uh, the asylum seekers there who are trying to get in uh, safe passage what what did what did they say they when they hear about this are they scared for you are they yeah. so happy are they my mom is scared yeah she you know she always worries about my safety um, whether it's you know coming to Islam, she was worried for my safety, you know, while they're, while they're traveling to create awareness, she's worried about my safety. She's always going to be my mom. She's always going to be my parents. She's always going to be scared for me. Um, but you know, at this other, at the same time, she's also, um, very happy and, and proud of who I became, 
you know so it's quite a different picture when you have the um the more of the acceptance and the hospitality the, sh the um accommodations that are made in, in japan now when you compare that to china have you yeah. been to china i have not well what's your what's your um, opinion there when you see like the the uyghur muslims you have like how many now are in the camp almost three million is it yeah it's uh it's a shame it's i you know what I, I i can't even pretend to understand it yeah because you know i'm not there i'm mm -hmm. not part of the culture and that society so you know for me to give just like such a I don't know. I don't think I can give that kind of an opinion. I, I can just see from the outside what it looks like. I something has to be done. Yeah. I mean, to have citizens of a country wrangled up and put in this in, a, in an area that they can never leave, and you know they're being told they can't. They can't practice their religion. They can't, you know, wear hijab. They can't uh, do the things that, you know, they grew up doing or recently came to do. You know, I mean, it's it's not. Uh, how, 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 are, how are Muslims received like the Muslim women, women who are imitating Mary, the mother of Jesus, wearing the hijab? Who are practicing that um, uh, modest dress code in Japan? How do they get received over there, from your knowledge? I honestly don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I will say though, like historically, yeah, Japanese clothing has been modest. Yeah, you know, um, I mean, you go back to what they looked like wearing kimonos. None of it was skin tight. Yeah, that's yeah, that's another part of the yeah. None of it was. You know, how do you what do you call it again? A the kimono. Kimono, yeah. Kimono, that's what we use in the, uh, was the martial arts also. It's, it's close, it's you know, and so that's why, like, like in kendo, you know, it's it's one of the oldest martial ways of uh, Japanese culture of, of fighting, right? It's it's um, way of the sword, how it's loosely translated. But, you know, I, I, I try to bring that into the, into the Muslim community because unlike a lot of other sports, uh, especially for the young Muslim sisters, you know, they have to come up with ways to adapt to play the sports, right, in in a modest way, right, uh, like in gymnastics or um, swimming or whatnot. But in kendo, you know, you wear hakama, which is the lower half, which is extremely, it's extremely comfortable. It, they're just really wide pants. And then you have your gi, which is, very loose fitting and then you wear your bogu your armor on top of all of that and mm -hmm. you know especially for a young sister who wears or an older sister doesn't matter wearing hijab you know you're covered you know so you don't have to worry about what do i have to figure out to to be a part of this right um i mean obviously it's not only for people or for women who wear hijab but um you know it, it's something where you don't have to worry about trying to find an alternate clothing apparel to fit this yeah right so when you hear about the mod we just mentioned a part of the culture of modesty uh the, the the greeting of respect then we talked about the cleanliness and now when you add in some of the other things if you're talking to someone of japanese background uh do you feel like because we know islam is the natural way you know worship the creator not the creation be a good human being be morally upright it just the tenets of islam just makes sense it's not hard to to comprehend to live it's the pure way so when you talk to someone who already in their culture has many of these these qualities have you felt have you had experience and talking to some japanese people have they been receptive uh, when you have you shared uh, some of the teachings of islam how do they take to it i mean honestly um it's not a subject that gets brought up, mm. I think, uh, because because I think there is this respect level even between generations of being Japanese American um, or people from Japan. I, I just think that there's this respect level. And, it, and I'm sure people have these discussions, but personally with me, they don't ask me mm. and they don't 
they don't talk about it. I'm always open to talk about it, but it's just not something that really happens. Yeah. And you know what? To be perfectly honest, I can't grow facial hair, right? It's like a for me, it's a Japanese gene. I just can't grow facial hair, right? So, and I don't wear a dopey. So it's like I, you know, you, if you were to look at me, you would walk right by me and not even think about saying salam to me, yeah. right? Uh, so I, I'm sure it's the same when other people see me from my culture, they probably just think of me as just Japanese and that's it. They don't think of me as being Muslim. Mm -hmm. When are you, you're going, you're going, you said you're going soon to, to Japan Yeah, in a few months. What, what, what's the, the main martial art there that's practiced? Well, I think that originates the, from there. Well, sumo is a huge, uh -huh. uh, uh, Japanese sport that is there. Uh, kendo. We'd have to adjust the tire for sumo. We, it's most, we, we, yeah, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of touching and grabbing in there. Yeah. But for like like kendo's, it's taught all the way from like grade school. What which what's taught? Kendo. Uh -huh. Kendo is the way of the sword. So, yeah. you know, when samurais could no longer practice being a samurai, they would hide it by doing kendo. And it's instead of the sword, it's a bamboo sword. Um. And so uh, that's what uh, I would say. That's maybe one of the majority of the martial ways uh, that is being taught is uh, the the fighting with the sword. Yes. Yeah. They yeah they have uh, some of the best. What is it? The, the um what's the name of the sword? The the specific sword that the samurai would use out there. There's a specific name for it. I forgot. Is it tatami sword or? Oh, the, the katana sword. Katana sword. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. Just even the craftsmanship of building the sword yeah. is is amazing. If you ever watch a documentary, so summarize. This is uh, the way the um, w when you study. This is from the Japanese. Yeah, it's right? the way of the samurai. The way, it's of, the the way of the sword. Correct. And then they had certain principles that they would live by. Yeah, it's the budo. It, yeah, uh -huh. it's it's uh, it's the world of it's it's the way of budo. It's 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 the way of the warrior. It's how there there are seven principles. There are several principles. Do you remember some of those? You had integrity. You had, uh, you had uh, courage. Uh, you had uh, what else? Character. You had really. I mean, if you look at all the points, uh, some really good that points that correlate really beautifully with with Islam. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I agree with you one hundred percent. Like if 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 many people would just live by those some of those principles, they probably wouldn't have been the internment camps, right? Probably not. Uh, yeah, if people were living by some of those principles, we wouldn't have much of the conflicts. And but that's the thing. A lot of times we go away from from um, many of these good principles that were ultimately sent down by the Creator for for, you, for humanity, and then we end up, uh, um, you know, following the the ways that uh, is. It's it's uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's easier to do the wrong thing than yeah. to do the good, the right thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so at the end, before we conclude, what what message um, would you have for, you know, now with the past and then what can we learn from that uh, for people who didn't know this history, who are learning about it now, listening to us, uh, seeing a Japanese Muslim for the first time, right? Uh, someone who has heard so many uh, negative things out there. Um, what, what would you say? What would you say to such a person? What, 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 you know, you know, I would ask them to ask me questions mm -hmm. or if you know a Muslim, talk to them. If you don't know a Muslim, befriend a Muslim, right? You know, it's, it, I think it's the only way that you would understand. Um, and if, you know, you want to talk about immigration policies or Muslim bans, you know, you have to talk to people to understand. Um, talk to people firsthand, right? People who uh, know about the subject, somebody who has experienced the subject in one form or fashion. You know, it's it's, it's all about the education. Mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 that's what it comes down to is just to be educated. Wow, that's so that's profound to be educated. I mean, when we're not educated properly, ignorance leads. Yeah, and it's it's a lot easier to like I said, you know, when ignorance leads you, it's just easier to do the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you see with now the with um, the uh, political race coming now um, with the new elections? 
do you see some of this stuff being brought back to the fur the surface again i do and i think um i think the only way to combat it truly is to get out and vote i think that's the only way that is a way to possibly stop it or to slow it down is to get out and vote um and hopefully you know whatever your vote is you know make sure it's the right vote you know whatever you believe in but i i think you know bring about awareness you know speak publicly about it speak up about it you know have conviction and you know just educate mm -hmm. do you get in because you you've done um just a couple more questions you've done extensive research in this area with the pearl harbor and everything i i have yeah yeah. How, how do you do you get do you ever get down and t what's your opinion when because uh, there's also a great debate and many have unfolded that a lot of this stuff was already known you know the what, what do you know what was co you mean what yeah. was coming yeah uh, it's it, it's really based on fear mm -hmm. truly everything that happened and the reasonings of why things have happened is truly based on fear there was actually no physical evidence to show that uh, that the accusations that the, that the military was throwing out there was actually true um, and it's it's been proven by uh, US documents so what was proven that that you know that it was that people that we knew about it Mm -hmm. it, was it was proved it was proved that that we knew about it that we didn't know about that we didn't know oh yeah. that we didn't that's proof okay. yeah because they were also saying that there's japanese submarines that are just outside of uh what was it san francisco or something i mean i mean they weren't but because you know this negative propaganda is, can be thrown out there and people will believe it mm -hmm. you know then that to them becomes their truth mm -hmm. and unfortunately the um the truth won't come out till many years later and if somebody unearths it and looks for the documentation it, i actually really quickly there's we every year the japanese american community across the united states puts out uh, uh programs called day of remembrance and that's always around february 19th yeah. because that's when executive order 9066 was was created and there's a young man named john osaki with an s he created this he made this film called uh, alternative facts and he interviewed many people involved um, in the proceedings of uh, what had led up to the incarceration of the Japanese Americans and he had proven documentations uh, that a lot of the allegations were completely false and it was a really eye-opening film um, you know, a lot of it, some of us, uh, some people that are historians of this particular subject kind of knew it. But when you watch this film, you actually hear the testimonies of people that were actually involved in the documentations that were unearthed uh, to prove it. It kind of it kind of just makes you think a little bit more, you know. Yeah. Thank you. Brian, thank, thank you, you so for much. thank you for being with us here. I appreciate your hospitality. Thank you. And uh we started with that beautiful greeting of peace. We end with peace. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Thank you so much. And thank you guys for tuning in. And there's a beautiful quote by Nelson Mandela. It brought that uh, came up to my mind where he said that people aren't born uh, hating. They're taught this hate and we got to teach them how to love. And when we live this beautiful way of life, uh, if you're a Christian, if you if you love God uh, with all your heart, mind, body, and soul, I mean, uh, you don't want to harm others. You you don't want to stand by when others are being harmed. Uh, us as human beings, we when we hear this kind of stuff, we don't want this stuff to repeat itself. That's so why we study it here. And now you have this sentiment that's growing. Uh, we talked about how it came with the Irish, the Catholic, the Japanese. Now you have it with the Muslims. Get to know your Muslim. Visit a mosque, an open house. Uh, call us 1-800-662-ISLAM. Ask your questions. Don't let that fear of the unknown turn into hate and then you attack what you hate. Get to know us, connect with us, and continue to watch The Dean Show. We'll see you next time. Until then, peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum.